Well, good afternoon, Julie, and thanks for joining us. Um, could I, as we start, invite you, if you'd like, to talk to us about the photo that's behind you or the image in your Teams chat? Yeah, for sure. And hello to you too, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me on. Um, the image in the background is the Blue River, and uh, I feel a really strong connection to Outback Australia. I lived in Alice Springs for 10 years, and when I was there watching the, the muddy water flow down the dry riverbed was, you know, the highlight of the wet season, and all the locals would get out there and, you know, watch the, the water coming down, sometimes slow, sometimes fast. Um, but I suppose it was there, which is quite a long time ago, I first kind of really began to understand in some depth um, the way the landscape really shapes uh, everything that we do. Um, and so recently in my work, I have had the absolute privilege of being able to visit some of these places again. Um, and, you know, really highlights to me again how much the river systems in particular dominate uh, our landscape and the social structures. So this photo is at Thargaminda. Uh, I did a morning walk around the Blue River, which goes around the around the township. The Shire shares boundary with um, New South Wales and South Australia. And the Blue River is really an interesting channel country um, river because it has no outlet. It's a closed uh, river system. Thank you. So, um, for some context, we've got a range of different speakers that are participating in the series, Julie. Some of them are speaking of their personal experience with flood impact. Um, some of them are individuals who've led and advocated for support for communities that are impacted by floods. Um, and we have another speaker who advocates for better and more coordinated legal responses to environmental disasters, so in a legal framework. Your, your experience, of course, um, is in the context of planning and risk assessment. So that's a focus that's more on prevention and mitigation rather than the aftermath and the response afterwards. Um, can I um, ask you as part of sharing your water story for the series to start by explaining the role that you play in risk assessment um, and in seeking to mitigate the impact of environmental disaster in a flood hazard context? For sure. Um, well, they say that our planning is the best tool we have in the toolbox to mitigate future risk. And I think I would have to agree with that. So planners have a really big role to play in mitigating future risk through ensuring that new development and new settlement patterns maintain an acceptable um, level of risk. So my role more specifically is helping to achieve that by translating some of the complex technical studies that our flood engineers do um, into a fit for purpose and long-term planning policy response that would then go into a local um, planning scheme. So in short, we'd kind of take, well, you know, what happens when it floods that the engineers work out and then we say, well, what is our response going to be to that risk? Um, so in Queensland, we have the um, state planning policy section for natural hazards, risk and resilience. And through that policy, we translate um, that uh, hazard identification into a planning scheme by doing a number of things. So one of them is to look at the context of the area, where and how it's expected to grow, what is their settlement pattern, um, how do they rely upon the river system or the landscape. Um, we define a local acceptability of risk. The state planning policy uses the terms of acceptable, tolerable or intolerable. Um, and in this, in this way, we can also identify not only acceptable risk, but we can identify places that are at intolerable risk already, so immediate risk to life and property. And then the third thing we do is develop those planning regulatory responses um, to uh, the evident risk. And so, this, again, the state planning policy gives us a few different pathways there. We can either accept the risk where it's already tolerable, we can avoid the risk um, where it's intolerable, or we can mitigate the risk uh, to an acceptable level. So the planning scheme will be able to, to frame that through its, through its codes. In some cases, we also identify locations that need to transition away because the risk is intolerable and there aren't um, feasible mitigation methods that can mitigate that risk to an acceptable level. And we do that through limiting development, limiting densities um, and slowly sending that message of transitioning away. Yeah, I was going to ask you just to expand on that a bit because that's, that is um, a circumstance where 
there is already a risk that is um, at that intolerable level for people and property, but it's not necessarily um, a risk that you can um, get rid of overnight or that you can remove people and property from overnight. We've got, we had that great example in Grantham of what was achieved after the terrible, terrible events of the 2011 flood, where there was an ability to, to move people relatively quickly, actually, out of that area of intolerable risk. But of course, um, the ability to do that, I expect, is going to be influenced by the communities, um, the size of communities, that the the reliance that communities might have on on the river, for example. Um, so then that solution, um, I imagine, has to be sort of tailored for each circumstance. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the real challenges with that kind of thing is, is um, as I just touched on before, individual definitions of what is tolerable risk. I have no tolerance at all personally for living through a flood, whereas other people, they are perfectly happy to have a metre of water go through the bottom of their house. So we have different levels of tolerance to start with. We have different um, exposures to risk. So some people have individual vulnerabilities or resources that enables them to mitigate risk. For example, insurance, um, the ability to, you know, move to a different property or those kinds of really intensely individual um, things. And then there's the values of why people live somewhere in the first place as well. You know, I, I also deal with coastal hazards and, um, and there it's really quite typical that people will make a choice to um, take a higher risk, even though they know that they might be exposed to open coast erosion or a storm tide because they value living on the coast so highly. So it's all a balance of all those really quite intensely personal decisions. There's never a one size fits all for that kind of transitionary arrangement. And it was unfortunate, I guess, in Grantham that, um, you know, there had to be so much um, devastation in order for that to occur. Um, could you help our listeners or viewers to understand broadly what's involved in natural hazard risk assessment? Um, it's a familiar thing to you and I practising in the area as we do, um, but not to um, some of our audience. Um, is it purely an environmental focus to risk assessment or does it also factor in, and I think you've touched on this already, the lived experience mm. of people from the relevant areas and communities of those of environment that have experienced environmental disaster? Um, and the other aspect of that I wanted to touch on is have you seen changes um, in the planning response um, in more recent times? Yeah. So um, a lot of things in that question, Sarah, but let's, yes. let's get to them <laughs> one piece Correct. at a time. Um, so in terms of the risk assessment, um, I'd probably defer to the flood engineers for, for part of that question. So you've got your hazard risk assessment, which is about the flooding behaviours, and then you've got um, a fit for purpose risk assessment to translate that into a, a planning scheme. So as I said before, our planning framework in Queensland is a statutory policy, so it requires every local government to consider natural hazards, risk and resilience in their planning um, instrument. Um, so things that uh, we would look at um, to put in uh, to embed that into a planning scheme um, are things that are unique to that uh, to that catchment. And I suppose um, at this point, I probably wanted to point out why, again, why that's such a such a challenge and it's so complex, because every catchment um, is really different. And so when you think about the blue behind me, I've had conversations out there with graziers who live at the top of the catchment um, and they can get on the phone and they can tell the graziers at the bottom of the catchment at Blue Lakes on the border, they can say, yep, I've had 50 mils here, the rain will be at your, the water will be at your place on Tuesday. And so they have like a week of, of uh, notification time before the water comes down the river. And yet that is in a really stark contrast. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we've got places that are really steep, short run catchments like the Bloomfield or the Barren that take water off the Great Divide and they've got a really short run out to the Pacific Ocean. And so that water um, is a really high velocity. It comes and goes um, very quickly. So we need to, when we're doing our uh, risk assessment, we need to look at those kinds of things as well. 
So in terms of lived experience, um, you know, that, uh, that um, uh, interpretation of tolerance is a really key part of that Queensland framework. So as I said before, you know, you've got your tolerance at the top end of the catchment is different to tolerance at the uh, bottom of the uh, bottom of the catchment. So um, figuring out that tolerance is another thing that the planners will do in terms of embedding that into a planning scheme. Um, and then the third part of it is also those local values, which um, we, we touched on in the last one as well, um, where I said, of course, you know, that people have that lived experience, they understand the risk, they have a higher tolerance, and they also value living in the place where they are. So they don't want to see anything change uh, necessarily, um, even if they are uh, risk aware. But in terms of awareness more generally, um, I think we've got a lot, really a long way to go. Um, it's, uh, it's disheartening that sometimes we have to have that lived experience in order for us to really make that step change and do something a little bit differently. Um, but I think that awareness generally, like, you know, um, reading a planning scheme is probably not something that people do in their spare time. <laughs> yeah. um, so awareness is really about, you know, hyper-local responses as well and that community awareness um, you know, talking to your neighbours, um, that is really the most official and beneficial way, efficient rather, and beneficial way to get those messages across and really get some action on the ground as well as to have that really hyper-local community awareness. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> how can risk-based planning um, support prevention or mitigation of environmental disaster? And also how does it um, sort of assist community preparedness? Right. Well, risk-based planning, yeah, that's um, it, it's it's almost a new concept. Although working in the industry, we we think it's been around a while. But um, you know, as I said before, planning is only one tool in the toolbox, but it's a really strong tool, and it can be really effective when we apply it stringently, and we apply it universally, and we apply it um, consistently. I think. Um, our knowledge and our ability to understand risk, and particularly with natural disasters, continues to improve and change uh, all the all the time, and it helps us make really good evidence-based um, settlement decisions. Um, so, in terms of the step change to risk assessment, in recent in recent years, you know, and, and still today, a lot of planning documents still have just a flat flood extent. So we thought of it as a, a line um, on a map. It was a single event. In a risk-based approach, we map, um, you know, different risk levels, low, medium, high, and these are based on um, the flood engineer's model where we can look at, you know, depth of water, velocity, warning time, so that we have, there's a much um, better understanding of the behaviours of that water that determines low, medium, high, extreme risk. Um, so, you know, and because of all of those things that we've just talked about in risk-based planning, values, tolerance, catchment behaviours, etc., it just means that there is absolutely no silver bullet. Um, there's a, you know, there's a challenge um, that not one size fits all. Yeah, and so when you're talking about that, that I think has been uh, quite a change that I've, I have observed is that um, focus starting to slowly shift from a concept that's familiar in terms of the words being the one in 100 year flood that most people would understand, um, but probably not everybody understands what it was or is actually intended to signify, which is, as, as is but is becoming um, more widely understood. I think that it's not a you will only have this flood event once in every 100 years. It's it's trying to indicate a probability. So we have seen, I think, a shift away from that um, mm. and and towards um, a, a greater understanding uh, or I think a broader understanding of flood behaviour. And that's so, so not just focusing on that one flood event, focusing on a range of flood events and um, the yeah. characteristics of those those events as well. Yeah, look, I think that's right. Um, and, you know, I also probably should add that in terms of that awareness and um, that 
lots of local governments are uh, also in Queensland are shifting to different methods of advising about um, flood awareness because as I said before you know it's not something that people are going to go and read in a planning scheme so it needs to be more readily digestible and consumable by the general public so there are a raft of flood information portals out there prepared by local governments that you know supply amazingly accurate information to a householder which are you know, very um, fit for purpose, easy to use. Uh, and then, of course, there's also those other programs that enhance our awareness, like, you know, Get Ready and, um, you know, pre-season preparation and all that kind of thing, which helps our awareness without people having to understand what a flood model does. Yeah, yeah, I do I do think about, well, my, my, my take on it, practising in the area, but also just as a, a lay person, is just is that that change being and I, I think I probably experienced it in the event in Brisbane this year that change between um, having experienced the 2011 flood um, and then the experience of the flood earlier this year which which as a lay person I observed to be quite different in its characteristics and affecting parts of the city that were not affected um, in 2011 or if they were affected they weren't affected so significantly, and I, I think, or my 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 own experience of that was that it sort of gave me a bit of an awareness that no two floods are the same, no two weather events are the same, and perhaps that just because you're not impacted by one particular event doesn't mean that you won't be affected by another. And so I think that's where um, this the risk based planning approach and sort of the moving away from just the singular focus on a particular event. To looking at broader ranges of events and um, 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 different ways that that weather events can be mm. experienced is really important. Yeah, and we we have really good records, and um, you know, one of the theories is that the the climate goes in cycles, as was, uh, and you'll see, like if you look at some of Bomb's um, graphs and charts, you know, of weather records, you'll see there'll be a cluster of really terrible events, you know, in a decadal cycle. And then you'll go through another cycle where you won't have a major um, flooding event for quite a long period. Um, we see that in things like, you know, I, I'm from North Queensland and, and we had 1918 was terrible season. Then again in 1958, lots of cyclones, lots of lots of flooding. Um, a lot of the records that have just been broken in recent um, times, you know, in the last 10 years are records from the turn of the century. So we had the, the Federation drought uh, across Australia, which was terrible, but preceding that, uh, the 15 years before the end of that century um, were amazing floods. We're still breaking, you know, the 1893 flood record from so-and-so. So there are... Um, <laughs> One of the one of the challenges is having that lived memory is only this long, whereas climate uh, cycles and climate change goes over a really long period. Um, so people talk about, you know, they still talk about the 1974 flood, I suppose, yeah. down here, and um, that's kind of still lived experience. But probably nobody talks about 1958 anymore or the storm surge of 19, uh, 1918. Um, so yeah, that comparison to previous events is problematic. Um, does risk-based planning, having regard to the focus of our series, Julie, and the human rights um, aspect of, of our focus, um, I thought it was important to ask, does risk-based planning support all communities? Um, um, does it support our most vulnerable communities, for example, people from our lower socioeconomic communities? Yeah, I, I hope so, because at its core, um, planning is a political and it is a, a profession for the greater good. So planners become planners because they want to make the world a better place and they do want to build uh, cohesive and fair communities uh, with equitable access. Um, so when we look at uh, natural hazards, I, I touched on before identifying locations that have intolerable risk. And then also there's the complexity of individual people being vulnerable because of personal circumstances as well or, or um, otherwise abilities. Um, I had a conversation the other day, in, in fact, with, uh, you know, an authority that was hesitant to um, change zone or, or limit um uh, development in a particular area that had significant capital uplift. Um, and so but then I said to them, you know, but 
today, like now, those people have the resources to combat or mitigate or live through it. But when we get to 2030 or 2040, when the risks get higher, yeah. they probably will say, oh, you know, I'm out now. Um, and yeah. then who moves in? The most vulnerable people in our society will then um, take the places of those in our most marginalised areas in terms of natural hazards. And so we need to think about that and try and prevent that from the get-go, not from not by 2040 when the event has already occurred and those properties are already um, decreasing in value and then we get the people, our most vulnerable people in the community are the ones that will inevitably live there. Yeah. Um, and I think you and I have touched on this in conversations before, the challenges in adopting risk-based planning. Um, and more importantly, I suppose, whenever we speak of challenges, how can we overcome um, the challenges that we face? Yeah. So we've already mentioned that horrible word, that Q100 thing. Yeah, we need to yes. get rid of that. So that's the first one. Um, so it's really problematic when t people start talking about, oh, you know, you've only done a model to a one in a hundred event. We had a one in a 500 event. Well, we should stop speaking like that. Um, we need to recognise, as we said before, that every event is different. And coming from North Queensland, I was I was reflecting on this um, a while ago that, you know, in cyclone country, there aren't any lines on maps. We yeah. don't, we don't say, oh, well, this wasn't the same as Tracy. It wasn't the same as Yasi or anything, because we all know that every event's different. And you you hang on to the ABC and you you listen for every cyclone warning because you know that it could get faster, it might get slower, it might change direction, it might change intensity, it might turn into a um, tropical low. Um, you just don't know. And so you have to be really alert. So how can we shift flood behaviours to that same kind of mentality yeah. um, would yeah. probably and be my first. And that's that's not to say that we don't recognise that that there are the areas that have higher hazard to flood. It's just it's just sort of perhaps not having complacency um, in other areas where they where people think, well, maybe I'm I've got no exposure, I've got no risk. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, yeah. You know, floods will always be different, rainfall intensity, parts of the catchment, um, you know, depending on saturation already. I don't know, we've talked about awareness before. Do you think there's a there's a heightened awareness in the community because we're currently talking about a third uh, La Nina year in a row? Um, you know, that that uh, I think people are starting to understand that, that it is all quite different. The other great challenge that we've touched on already is that divergence of values, um, the divergence of risk tolerance. Um, it means that every household, community, governance body, whatever it is, makes decisions on a different set of parameters. Yeah. Um, and that again uh, adds that challenge that there is no silver bullet in the policy or the application of um, flood regulation because every community will be different. Yeah, and that's that is again interesting, Julie, because I think I observed um, in a lot of the media um, and reporting and things in the again in the aftermath of the flood earlier this year, there was a lot of rhetoric around um, and sim simplistic, I think, around well, why why on earth are people still in these locations that are known to flood, and they should just we should just get them out. Um, you know, we should get people out of these areas, which which um, is perfectly understandable given the trauma and just horror of what occurred. But it's also, I, I suppose, simplistic in terms of what you're talking about, of these complex values that different communities and different individuals have. And that really, again, that's part of that human rights focus of the series, is that, um, that people's values and um, their human rights are a part of the risk assessment process as well. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, there's there's any number of stories about people who will say, oh, yeah, yeah, I flooded, you know, four times in the last 10 years, but it's all okay, and yeah. they're happy to stay there. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, we hear devastating stories about people who aren't risk aware and yeah. they're the least able to recover as well. Yeah. Um that don't have secure work or they haven't been able to secure insurance or they're just new arrivals and they don't understand anything about our weather patterns. Yeah. Um, so there's, there is a, a plethora of situations and reasons 
about how people get involved in natural hazards. And similarly, there's the same number of um, CNROs and trying to get them out um, yep. of that as well. Yeah. Um, and last of all, we're coming to a close. Um, <laughs> uh, um, and I think this is a question we're asking all of our speakers. Are there any final key messages that you'd like to end with? Um, well, I've got a couple, and I think first and foremost, it's perhaps just box to... moment. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. I'll try not to be, uh, you know. Anyway, um, probably first and foremost is that risk understanding is everyone's business. Like planners, um, take a bit of a bashing after every event. You know, how do the planners do this? Why are you there? I, I don't mind. I've got broad shoulders, and that the more we elevate the discussion. Uh, the louder the voices, then we will see better decision making, reliance on our evidence base that we already have, and a little bit um, faster progression, I guess, of embedding a, a quite a strong policy position that we already have. Um, so risk understanding is everyone's business um, is probably a, a key message. We can't rely on other people to tell you what your risk is. Um, probably the other thing that bothers me is that the planning pipeline is quite long. So by the time, you know, you have an event, policy changes, and then we have to embed it into a planning scheme, you know, scheme cycles are decadal or even longer. Um, and then of course, planning can only deal with things in the future. So one of our issues is dealing with legacy transition. That's, that's a really hard thing as we've talked about. So compressing that pipeline so that we can implement policy faster um, I think would be uh, a wonderful thing. Um, and as probably, a, you know, it's a tangible example of that is that our state planning policy that requires uh, embedding of, of natural hazards was first drafted in 2014 when we had planning reform. It's now in a 2017 version and we are in 2022 uh, and we still have local government planning instruments that do not have a risk-based um, flood overlay in them. So, you know, we need to drive that process a little bit faster yeah. so that things happen on the ground. Um, and um, yeah, and I think we've learned today that it's not a simple thing. Um, planners deal with a really wide range of tasks in their work as well, you know, whether it's social planning or, you know, natural hazards or economic development and height and density is always an issue. Um, you know, so a lot of a lot of time within our own industry, there there isn't sufficient skills, understanding and capacity for planners sitting in smaller offices to understand uh, how to really integrate uh, natural hazards into their planning scheme. So with the Planning Institute, we've been advocating quite strongly for additional professional development, uh, capacity building um, and support to make sure that local governments understand how to embed a risk-based approach into their planning scheme. All right, well, I think that'll bring us to a close. Thank you so much um, for joining Pleasure. me, for sharing your perspectives. And um, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank We're you done. for having me.